we are back and as promised, like I said, the first guest on today's episode is amazing. He is the host and producer of the show, Las Vegas Tonight, and he also has won the Associated Press Award for Best Talk Show. And of course, if that's not enough, he has been inducted into the Nevada Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Please welcome Dale Davidson. Thank you. Nice to meet nice you, Nice to Dale. meet you, Priscilla. It's I've watched your honor. show. I enjoy it very oh, much. Oh, thank you so much. That's yeah. clearly an honor considering everything that you've done. Oh, well, so. thank you. Thank you. Amazing. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, so you obviously, like we talked about prior, have a lot on your belt, you know, when it comes to what you do. You know, you have all of these majors, you have communication, you have been kind of like a veteran within this whole business. Yes. So what was that like for you in the beginning? What's yeah. your start like? Veteran means old, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, listen, to me, that means one of the greatest. I'm going to say that means... That's like, okay. You know, I'm all right with that. All I'm all right with that. No, I started in, in radio when I was 15 years old. Wow. <clears throat> Just sweeping the floors and learning how to spin a record and all that sort of thing. One of the early uh, FM rock and roll stations. Uh, back in Cleveland, Ohio. And ever since then, I've been mostly uh, in broadcasting, uh, in radio, about every job you can have in a radio station, mm -hmm. including I was a, just, I think if I got, got any skill set on interviewing, I learned it from radio. Because I did a, uh, a, a talk show in Arizona. Uh, in fact, that was the one that was voted by the AP as the talk show of the year. And I had 15 hours worth of guests wow. every week. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah, that Three is. hours a day. So I mostly interviewed people every now and then. I'd do, I'd do a monologue, but most of the time I would. And I kind of learned what worked mm -hmm. uh, by making mistakes. And uh, I remember I had a producer uh, who took me to a network. I ended up as a network talk show host and so on. And I said, how do I get better at this? He said, just keep doing it. And you'll be the same way. And that is true. Yeah, the you, more you do something, it keeps you learning yeah. every single time. Yeah. Especially yeah. meeting people. Yes. Right? Or you yes. learn just by meeting people. Yes. I'm sure yes. you know everyone has a different personality. They come in and you're like, all right, how do we handle, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, one of the other things I've learned, and I, and I taught this because I've done some college teaching uh, to kids um, in business and media. As well and uh, one of the things I learned is what I call uh, you have to ask what I call high gain questions and a high gain question is an open-ended question you can't answer it with yes or no what you have to do is think about it uh, project an answer and then deliver the answer and so uh, an example of a high gain question that people use pretty often is where do you see yourself in five years you know, where do you want to take your show? Um, what is there uh, about your show that you'd like to change? You know, those right. are those are high gain questions. They cause your guests to speculate, and when they say, "Hmm, good question," or "I never thought of that," or they just hesitate for a second and go, hmm, "Then you know you've asked a good question." Right. And so, what was your um I don't know how you say this. When you did a lot of broadcasting and radio, right. was there a certain theme or thing that you centered on, depending on the group of people or what you would talk about? Yeah. No, I just look for interesting people. Okay, you know, so like you, you did a lot yours. of the scouting. And yeah, you know, okay. yeah. I had a producer, and here's what's something that's interesting. The show I do now, and as I mentioned to you, I just did show number 450, 15 years worth of these shows. And the one thing I, I basically learned is uh, just look for interesting people. Whatever you do, just look for interesting people. Yeah, and the more and open they are, obviously, yeah. open people too, it and helps. Some, yeah, sometimes they're, they're a little tougher to draw out than others. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've noticed yes. that. Um, but I've also learned that it's a, it's a great idea to shut up and listen. You know, the one thing that kind of bugs me about interviewers uh, on cable TV shows and so on more about them than it is about the guest. Yes. You know? Yeah, and they talk over them and, you know, they want to be on camera all the time. And that's really not what it's about. People aren't tuning in for that reason. Right. If you want to last a long time, ask, get good guests, ask people good questions, and then uh, sit back and listen. 
Yeah, because yeah. at that point, when you have the, you know, the means and the reason to have someone come on your show, you got to that point, it's kind of, for me, like a helping out, you know, I'm giving back. I'm going to showcase these people that come on because yeah. I know what it's like for people not to do that for me. Oh, yeah. So I love meeting people because you learn more. Sure. But others, it's obviously great to let other people know who this amazing person is. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, learning about their trials and tribulations and sure, figuring out sure. how we can learn from each other. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I, yeah, you have the right attitude about it, Priscilla. And I think you're going to be very good at it for that reason. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that's such an honor, honestly. Yeah. So let's talk about Las Vegas tonight. So how sure. long has that been broadcast? I started it in 2007. So, yeah, it's about 15 years ago. What's interesting about it is I was the general manager and then the owner of the only Christian TV station in the state of Nevada, which is right here in Las Vegas. Uh, my partner and I sold it in 2015. But it gave me an opportunity for a long time to get to know people in that community, the Christian community, if you will, business people and church people and, you know, you name it, uh, and just people in general. And the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, requires that local television and radio stations do local public service programming. Uh, three hours a week, I think, is still the rule. And so I was doing this show to meet that obligation. And to tell you the truth, when we started off, it was kind of rocky. You know, it was just kind of between two ferns, you know, and mm -hmm. we talked about potholes and exciting stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, but then all of a sudden, um, it's really, you know, and, I, and I, I give it up to the Lord and give my thanks to God for this. Uh, some really interesting people started showing up. And I wasn't even chasing them. And from that point forward, uh, you know, when I was doing my radio show, I told you about you know, trying to find guests all the time, and I did have a producer who helped me. And, but all of a sudden, people started showing up, and they wanted to be on the show, and they had really interesting backgrounds. And I expanded it from a half hour to an hour uh, when a network uh, called me up and said they wanted to carry it. And a network with over 100 TV stations coast to coast called the Walk TV uh, wanted me to wanted me to, to give them an hour a week, so that's what I did. And I thought maybe I would do segments, you know, like most shows. I think even your show, you do several segments mm -hmm. in your show, and from a plus standpoint, that gives people an opportunity to see lots of different, you know, guests and turnover and interest. Uh, a long-form program like mine, a one-hour-long program, what it offers is more in-depth. So that's, I think, what attracted guests to come and be on the show. They knew that I was going to let them say what, basically whatever they wanted to say. I'd ask them questions. And I got answers that were just amazing. People telling me about their childhoods and yeah. stuff on camera just because we had the time and well here's another technique you can use when you ask a question and they give you a short answer sometimes i just sit there and look at them don't say anything <laughs> yeah and then they're like oh uh uh oh <laughs> they have <laughs> i was just kidding i was just kidding you know <laughs> they have, they're, they're under a certain amount of pressure to fill the to fill the gap mm -hmm. and the next thing you know they're telling you all about their childhood about their problems and you know whatever, which is not my objective. My objective is to talk about being redeemed by Christ, you know, and they all have a story like that. Yeah. So it's kind of inspiring, you know, and that's what I try to do every week. I do a show every week, and I try to make it interesting and fun and and give people out there the opportunity to get to know someone. Yeah, because you never know where people come from, what their journey. You know, what you see on the outside, they might be really successful, but what led to that? Yes. Right? What are their morals, or well, how do they, you know, are they going to carry that on? Yeah. You know, what is the purpose of the reason why they're doing what they're doing? Yeah. You know, and so backing off of that, do you believe that you, what drives you to continue to do your show and get these people on and getting them to open up? Yeah. Is there something that you take from it? I, yeah, I, I feel it's my calling. Yeah, you know, when... Uh, 
when I left my last job, which was really a good job, you know, my wife was, are you crazy? You know, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> God bless her. Uh, but she has been a great supporter of mine. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I just knew that I wanted to use the skills that the Lord gave me uh, to communicate His grace to the public at large and try to help people who were lost be found. That's all. So I do it for that reason. Uh, I certainly don't do it for the money because there's none. <laughs> Show business, everyone. You know. <laughs> People don't realize that because there's you know this is this tiny fraction of one percent you know that makes millions and millions you know the right. Tom Hanks of the world you right. know that make millions and millions of dollars but the rest of us are just you know yeah it's hard work though hardest work you ever do it's tough but oh, you get yeah. it. <laughs> that's, yeah that's the other thing people don't know and you know you're an entertainer so you know there are very and your next guest Kelly. She knows too. It's hard work. It's, hard. it's hours and hours and hours of work perfecting your craft yeah. and uh, putting up with uh, some nonsense yep. sometimes. Uh, it's just even... people. You have to learn how to deal with people. <laughs> yes. If you don't know how, honey, I would, I would suggest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> To get to these seats right here behind <laughs> that, that camera, and Maria that's shot. right. We, we, we've had to come up for a oh, lot, yeah, a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. And people don't understand that or, or really appreciate it, and they should. Yeah. You know, just because you, you know, you wanted to do this forever, right? Mm -hmm. Since you were a kid, did you yes. want to be that, doing yes. this? Yes. And you grew up in Chicago. Yes. Did you have opportunities there? Not much. I mean, I studied there. I went to school. Got a degree in and dance and Where'd I always knew go? what I wanted. Uh, Illinois wasn't. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. down in Bloomington, oh, Illinois yeah. State. Oh, yeah, yes. I know where that is, yeah. Yes, so got a BFA and then I always knew I wanted to be in front of the camera. But I knew staying in the Midwest wouldn't be for me. So I yeah. came out west and that's when. But I came here ready, right? I don't know what it's like to come to Vegas um, starting from nothing, building a portfolio, meeting people, learning the industry. Because learning the industry is probably the biggest thing oh, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. you'll have to do. Yeah, so. you know, I, I hear that so often when I have entertainers on my show. You know, it's who you know, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's the truth. You you need to know a lot of people, and you need to network, and they need to know you. But you're going to be able to deliver when you're That's calling. what I mean. You have to be able to be like, hey, this is me. But if you have me come on, you hire me for something, I'm going to show up and show out. I'm going to show you why you made a great choice. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. that's where your reputation and the networking comes in handy because then word of mouth. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I had a good friend. Uh, I went to film school, studied motion pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I thought I was going to do. I knew I wanted to be on camera, you know, and, and I had a television show then. Can you believe it? I was 20 years old. That was a couple of years ago. And uh, I had a friend who ended up uh, being a, uh, a director of production and a, uh, an assistant director, and he worked on major motion pictures. And I remember he told me that that he was once 15, 15 minutes late, early on in his career, 15 minutes late for a shoot. Mm -hmm. And the boss took him aside. Everybody had already left, got in their trucks and left the location and said, this is the last time you're going to be late. Or the next time will be the last time you work in this industry. Yep. And they're serious. It is. That's yeah. what people think people don't know is that your first impression is going to is the most important one, and every mistake you make is can cost you. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people don't think that. They think that you know they can just do whatever and like because they think they're here. But then, you know, I, that's how I was trained, really. You know, because yeah. I always was the type that was never wanted, that was always rejected because I'm shorter and I'm Asian. So back then. It was, I had to really prove myself. Oh, yeah. So that's when I took the time. I didn't rush it to make sure I would work this on my This is when you were modeling? I, I did both at the same time. So I started oh, on did. 16. Oh, okay. And so obviously, like, no one really paid attention to it. Like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so then that gave me time to be, like, in silent, working around, training, to get to the point where I got in front of agents and said, here. But even when they would decline me, I had now built a self-esteem and confidence going, hey, I know I'm good. Yeah. Okay, that's just going to motivate you to work harder. So I built that. You know, I wanted the theater training to be good at acting before I went on camera. It's yeah. a little different training on stage than it is. It's the best film. way. It's the best way. So that's what I did too. Yeah. I did acting as well. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you know. I do know. 
Oh my God, this has turned into, welcome to the Daily Talk with Dale. <laughs> Meet Dale and Priscilla. <laughs> Learn about both of them the same time. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why <laughs> not? We'll just do this more and more and more. So, since, you know, going back to, now that you've heard a little bit of my story, you've seen and met people coming to Las Vegas and seeing Las Vegas change oh, since yeah. you started. Sure. And what would you say that's like? It's astounding how much this city has changed. Not only all the buildings, you know, all the hotels have changed. Uh, the industries have changed. The people have changed. It's grown like topsy. It's just phenomenal. And the opportunities are there. I think there are more opportunities now for people in show business than there used to be. That's the good news. Bad news is there's now 5,000 more people a month going right. to town. Right. So, now so like there's LA. plenty of competition, you know, like you need some. Right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's why like... I'm not in LA, guys. <laughs> you got to be a big fish in a smaller pond. And oh, then yeah. once your name gets out there, it, it, it helps. Well, then you can live anywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. like a lot of movie stars yeah. do nowadays. You know, my... There's a method to the madness. Oh yeah, the business, the game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It's really important to understand the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have a friend who's been an agent and a manager and all those sorts of things. I guess he's retired now. Keeps claiming he's retired, but he's always told me, he said, "Talent's important. Sure, it's about fifty percent of it. The rest yep. of it's marketing yourself. Oh yeah, and the understanding the business. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the business about?" And why is it so tough, you know? Yeah. It really is a very, very yeah. tough industry. Yeah. And we do everything we can to, to make it easier, you know, on people who come. I have interns that will come and, you know, work for me for a while. And like I said, I was teaching at a, at a Catholic university down in San Diego for five years uh, as, as a part-time professor. And... Uh, Here's some advice I used to give the kids, actors in particular, but directors and production majors and people like that say, <clears throat> are you going to be asked to do things that's outside of the scope of your, uh, your moral sense uh, or your ethical sense? The answer is yes, you are. Uh, my recommendation is be ready with your answer. Oh, yeah. 100%. Just be, you know, otherwise you're going to stumble around, you're going to think about it, you're going to say yes and then regret that exactly. you said yes. Exactly, and they're yes. going to walk over you, you're going to be like, okay, yeah, yeah. whatever. And what I found is they will respect you, but they'll also watch you. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly if you say, well, I have a belief system, you know, and I'm a Christian or whatever it happens to be. Uh, well, they're going to watch you and see whether you walk your talk, you know. Oh, yeah. And so that's good for you. You know, yeah, that helps you. have you. to be strong. That's yeah. what I learned. You have to be strong. And a lot of people are going to try you. They're going to walk over you. They're going to use you. And the more successful you become, the more you that you experience that. Yeah. And you have to differentiate between whether or not this is genuine and whether to hold your place. And yeah. You know the boundaries. Yes. Because um, I know for me, like, I'm nothing. You see me now, but I, you know, I'm petite. I'm Asian American. And now I'm a little older than what right. the industry would want starting out. But you have to learn in order to change these things, guys, and make it a little easier for you is to know the game before you change the rules, before yeah. you play it, right? Yeah. Yeah. To know how it works so you know how to go around those and find the loopholes, yeah. enable yourself to be what you want. Yeah. Um, and that's why a lot of people give up because they're waiting for people to come to them. They're waiting for that day it happens. But yeah. you have to be the one. But you got to go get right? it. And I'm sure a lot of people that you've interviewed obviously have said those things or you've seen moments in their life where... You know, they had a weak moment or like, dang, if I was only, you know, so it helps. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. so with all this knowledge, obviously, like you have had, I've been meaning to mention this, the pleasure to be a writer for President Ronald Reagan. That's true. Yes. Yeah. So tell us how that came to be. Yeah. I went to work for a, uh, a couple of friends uh, who were producers of a, uh, of a, a preacher. Uh, back in the day, his name was Rex Humbard. He was one of the early Christian television evangelists. Uh, and he was a singer, and he, had, he was very entertaining. Uh, he did something that uh, a lot of preachers didn't do then and still don't do now. He had a primetime television show. On uh, First it was uh, once a quarter, then once a month, then once a week on ABC. 
and he'd have names, you know, Pat Boone or Johnny Cash or you know whoever, who are Christian entertainers, and they produced that show, and they hired me to be a writer, mm -hmm. and they liked my writing, and so I was doing all kinds of different things. I was writing commercials. I was writing promos. I was writing white papers. I was writing, you know, whatever they wanted me to do. And I, I was not a believer then. I was not a Christian then. Oh, and they knew okay. that about me. Okay. And they, they had a beautiful building in Akron, Ohio, in fact. Uh, and it, they, they had one complete wall of uh, glassed-in studios, just studio, 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 studio for their productions. And they were um, translating all of, all of Rex Humbart's shows into a, a, over a hundred different languages around the country. And I had one of those little studio rooms myself, and I was the only one that was allowed to smoke in the building. I was a smoker then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they got me a little ashtray with a little like, <laughs> air thing that sucked it in, and, and they said, you know, just don't ever swear, and you know, don't come in drunk, you know, whatever it was. But I was the only non-Christian working there. Well, just being in the environment, obviously, I was supposed to be there because one of those fellows uh, led me to Christ years later on a long airplane trip from coast to coast uh, for a commercial that I was acting in, in fact. And what I learned, I, I learned pretty well, writing under pressure, writing on difficult topics, and then they got a contract with the Republican National Committee to write commercials for the Ronald Reagan campaign. And I wrote those commercials, a lot of them. And they liked me. And so after he was elected, this was his reelection, after he was reelected, uh, they hired me to come in and write uh, speeches for him. Wow. Yeah. So I had a, got to experience that White House thing. And, and uh, Got to know some people that are friends to this day, all these years later, and, uh, and got to sit next to Ronald Reagan and, and uh, write words that came out of his mouth, which was just an astonishing thing to sit and watch TV and say, there it is. He just said my line. That, that's <laughs> you know? So you, that, the amount of pressure, though, you imagine, you're just like, that's dang, this is what the President of the United States is literally going to yeah. say on camera. Yeah. I, I'm the one that's going to be, you know, yeah, in yeah. charge of that. But yeah. was it a lot of, you just had to kind of, how did you navigate? You're learning him, sitting there observing, seeing things yeah. that he would say, and yeah. obviously knowing, you know. Writing for someone know. else, particularly a politician yeah. or a preacher or anybody that's on TV a lot, you need to learn their phraseology, and what kinds of things that they normally say, yeah. their pacing. Uh, some people you would write fast because they talk fast. Others you would write slow because they talk slow. Uh, Phrases, pauses, you know, he was he was a head he was a head tipper. He would do this all well, well tail. There you go again. You know, and he would do it, he was slow paced. And one of the best uh, on camera communicators I ever I ever saw or worked with. Uh, I think maybe the best president doing it. And that was experience, you know, he was an actor for a long time. And then he, he was hired by the General Electric Company to go from rubber chicken dinner to another rubber chicken dinner to another rubber chicken dinner. That's just what we call them, political <laughs> dinners, and talk about the American way. And so he assembled, he had a whole, he had, he had file cabinets full of jokes and speeches, and he practiced, and he got really, really good at it. So, and he was good at, at ad living too, you know. Yeah. So a good, really good, he was easy to write for. We had fun. Yeah, That's we right. had fun, yeah. yeah. There were, you know, pressure days, but he was uh, a really good man, uh, a buncular, I call him like an uncle, you know, it's like having an uncle. And uh, a Dutch uncle sometimes, you ever heard that phrase? No, I don't know. That means a Dutch uncle is one that will tell you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and sometimes he, you know, he would give me a dud jungle talking to, and then uh, the next day was everything was fine. It was like nothing happened. But, you know, that's he was a he was a gem to work for. 
So after that experience, I didn't, I didn't think I was ever going to top it, you know, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go back into regular secular broadcasting anyway, so I did. But, uh, yeah, he was, he was the tip-top guy. Yeah. yeah, that's insane. Okay, now I can say if I go back and I want to search those speeches. I know I know who wrote those. It's like I'm gonna feel like, oh my god. <laughs> it's like I'm right in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. yeah, I don't even know how one movie would handle it. You obviously had a lot of confidence in your writing and a lot of confidence in yourself to be able to just walk up in front of them and just be like, Hey, how, so, how's it going? Um, yeah, how's it going? Yeah. I was surrounded <laughs> by people like that too. And I was in my thirties, you know, I was in my early and mid thirties. So yeah. You know, I was a kid, really. Didn't know any better. Maybe I'd be nervous now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and the times have changed now, you know. So I can't imagine the difference between if you're a writer then versus if you're a writer now. And things that you, you know, there's a lot more that you have to worry about saying and doing, oh, yeah. obviously. And, yeah. you know, if you show too much, you say too much, you say nothing at all. It, you can be very, it's very controversial. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I came up in journalism. I studied journalism. I was a... I was a reporter. I worked on camera. I worked as a Associated Press correspondent. I, I did a lot of different writing type jobs, you know, and that's that's really what I learned. Um, I was taught objectivity, you know. I was taught that you're not supposed to put yourself in the story. This is not about you. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes back to what right. we were talking about interviewing people. Exactly. It's not about you. It's about them. And I learned it that way, and it's. My journalism professors are probably spitting in their grave to see what's happened. You know, you look at whether it's MSNBC and CNN or Fox or whoever it is, they all have a point of view and they're all communicating that point of view and twisting the facts to make it fit their agenda. Yep. Yes. And that was just unheard of when I was coming up. And we all looked at people like Walter Cronkite, it was way before your time. And he was, you know, it was like watching Dad on television, you know. And he just gave the straight up facts, you know, here's here's what's going on in the world today. And he always ended with, and that's the way it is. And it's not a bad impression, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I wish it were that way now. I really do, but it's not, so you have to communicate in the environment that you're put in. Yeah. You know? And it's a little more most, work. It is more Monitoring work. yourself while also speaking the truth while also trying not to put yourself in it and also focusing on what it is and then hearing backlash. Because everyone's very open about their feelings now. Everyone's very attentive to every little detail. Yeah. Um, and so even if there is something that we were to say now that we are completely unaware of that's a now thing that is not okay. Yeah. You know, there's some times where we're not doing this actually but we're going to suffer the consequences for those things. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine how serious to be at a level where you have a big mass audience um, being on those stations or being in politics or being, you know, yeah. a bigger yeah. person. Like Tom Hanks. Yeah. And every move you make, it's like, oh, am I going to fire today? Or what, am I going to lose my job? You know, yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, and I've always wanted to ask this question sure. since I've never actually met someone who's talked about being a journalist and all those things. Is there a big difference would you say you know doing shows like this um obviously there's similarities but would you say it would be along the lines of being a journalist yeah or not? yeah i think so i think many of the skill set is the same the difference between being a talk show host and being a journalist used to be as a journalist you're neutral right mm -hmm. you're there to bring the facts out from the interviewee right and a talk show host has an opinion. Okay? Mm -hmm. They're commentators or they have opinions. Uh, that's the difference. Now that line has been blurred, so people call themselves journalists who are really talk show hosts. But the skill set's very similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always wonder that. I'm like, yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, especially yeah. now with like the death of R.I.P. or Barbara Walter. Like I you know, you yeah. watch a lot of her interviews. Yeah. She can play both to the same. Yes. Like I look at things, the people that she interviews, and kind of when I'm looking at it, when I'm trying to, you know, look at my interviews and trying to brush up to see what else I could do or how to be better, you watch these people and see how attentive they are and see how they ask questions and, like, change it towards the person. Right. And so someone like that, I've always wanted to talk to someone who also has that type of experience 
um, not just has her own show, but also has been in a world of broadcasting and journalism through the years, right. you know, just recent, um, and see what, what that's like. Right. Because I've always been intrigued. Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent question that you ask because it's the fundamental question that, that you need to decide what you want to be in this industry. If you want to be a journalist and you want to be a good one and you want to be recognized for asking who, what, where, how, when, why in such a fashion that the truth comes out, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. If you want to communicate Priscilla's opinions on what's going on in the world, that's perfectly okay. But it's a it's a separate function. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I try to I try to be a talk show host who asks questions, you know, right. and identify an opinion. I usually try to make it really obvious I'm giving my opinion now. Because I'll say, well, that's fine. But in my opinion, I think, you know, so the world knows that this is, this is not their opinion. This is not, you know, written on the, on the tablets. You yeah. know, it's just my opinion. Yeah. And I think that's an okay thing for you to do. So I've always wondered, you know, I try not, I try to make, obviously make it about the person I'm interviewing yeah. and not really talking about what I think. The questions I ask, I kind of, and this is a great thing for me to expose to you guys, is yeah. never, if I'm asking a question, it's not because of my own belief. You know, it's things that are on the world. So if I'm asking someone, well, you know, there's some people that think blah, 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 and like, this is what it's seen as. You know, I never want it to come across that I'm judgmental towards person interviewing or right. you know just for them to give their opinions right. they talk about them and how they navigate right and so it's the line that I'm like worried because I never yeah. want to be I know cancel culture you know I'm coming up so I'm trying not to get my neck cut off like too early <laughs> so I'm just like <laughs> tread lightly but also yeah. you know bring yeah. everything out without yeah yeah, yeah so, this cancel culture thing is it's, it's a lot so it's hard. absurd what it's doing. To I'm people. scared. The minute that character's on, I'm like, hmm, not today, Chris I Girl. We're not going to get married today. <laughs> but it's been an absolute honor. This talk has been amazing. Oh, like, I can great. literally sit here and I feel like I can talk to you. You would be my Dutch uncle, I feel. Okay. <laughs> to sum it up, I'll tell you the be, truth. He would. And tell that, her that's the truth. what yeah. you know, everyone needs is someone like Dale who has all this advice. Yeah. You know, we may not walk the same paths or the same time periods and live through different right. eras of life, but everything I can see, there's still the same thing behind it. You know, oh, yeah. There's still the morals, the, the value, the work sure, ethic, sure. and that's what I value the most about you. Oh, well, so thank everyone, you. Dale Davidson, please tune in to Las Vegas tonight. I thank hope you. to have you back on. It's been an amazing chat. I'm sure, I hope we didn't bore anybody. I was on board. <laughs> I was very intrigued. I was like, I could talk about this over coffee, over a drink, whatever, sure, anything. brandy, yeah. anything. But everyone, Dale Davidson. Thank you so much. It's uh, been an Priscilla, honor. Yeah, it's, it's been, been an honor being on honor. the show. Thank and you. you've got a, a big, big future ahead of you. Oh, and I'll watch you with great interest. Thank you so much. When we Keep come back from the there. break, you will be having an award winning Chantus, an amazing singer in Las Vegas, right up next. See you after the break.